Hey everybody, welcome to the panel discussion on burnout and imposter syndrome. It's going to be led by V, Manny Devil, many of you know. It's going to be a discussion of three to four people with three outlined questions specifically on how they have or have not experienced imposter syndrome specific to cybersecurity, hacking, what portions that may be due to diversity or specifically cybersecurity hacking niche, and how not just to get into security, but to stay in security and in the community. Give it up, y'all. Thank you so much. And thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone, for being here. I really appreciate your time. And um, biggest thank you to the panelists already. But um, yeah, exactly what he said. My name is V. I go by Vanity Devil or just V. Um, my actual name is Victoria. I do share it, but I, I just go by V because I'm really bad with names. <laughs> so <laughs> that's kind of the why. Um, I wanted to talk about imposter syndrome and burnout in the hacking community because I feel like uh, it's something that maybe we need to talk about more as far as uh, we have lots of resources and talks always at conferences like these, like how to get into security, what, um, what, uh, sorry, what uh, certifications to get, what school to go to, all those different things about getting in. But then there's not a lot of uh, people who talk about, okay, once you're in cybersecurity and you're a senior, you've been in for 10, 15 years, and you still don't feel like you know what you're doing. Uh, or, you know, you're still like everyone going on Google and copying paste code and just like, oh, yep, that's, I did that. And, you know, maybe not feeling the same level of accomplishment as if you had written in, then not, you know, spiraling. So, um, I wanted to do some introductions, uh, discuss uh, about burnout and imposter syndrome, what's unique to the hacking community, and then get right into the panelist questions. A uh, quick disclaimer, any and all opinions expressed here are of my own and do not reflect my employer, and I believe that is the same for my three panelists. Um, I'm 10 years in cybersecurity. I'm a GRC specialist, and I also do VC, so G GRC work uh, through my own LLC. Um, I've done previous talks here at B-Sides, at Dallas Hackers Association, and at DC214, including things about racial recognition, drag makeup, NFC chips and nails, um, data privacy and menstrual tracking apps, as well as applying a threat model to uh, an individual in a personal um, life as far as uh, helping protect your own family's data uh, and privacy. I want to introduce uh, Vicki or Victoria. Um, I know Vicki from actually one of my first talks. I had talked about facial recognition and drag makeup and how it can stop the um, infrared cameras from actually recognizing you and why that's a good thing. And we had some uh, long discussions about um, makeup and inclusion in the community as well as you know building uh, diversity to help support the community. Um, Victoria, did you want to say a little about yourself? Awesome. Um, let me think. Um, so yeah, I am um, a trans cow. I think that's kind of where I come at it, where you just kind of learn not to give a fuck. And when you get cancer, you really don't give a fuck. <laughs> and that's kind of my point, kind of where I'm coming from. Um, I've got a background in data science. Um, I've been a DBA, um, but I also have kind of the cybersecurity background, like you know, doing things like, yeah, I really don't trust you. I'm gonna kind of go and dig and finding all kinds of horrible holes and things on the blue side of things. Haven't done red team. Um, trying to think of anything really interesting. Um, found a back door so I could chat into uh, Elvira's chat in the 90s. Um, I may have accidentally broken into the EPA in college. Um, accidentally, may have, allegedly. Um, what else? Oh, social engineering. I'm a big proponent of social engineering and using practical jokes that are not malicious as a way to practice and expand your skill set. And um, after the talk, ask me about Lupe. 
and some of my social engineering with preachers and uh, people selling me, trying to sell me uh, warranties, extended warranties. I've had some fun talks with those people. Thank you so much, Vicki. Next, I wanted to introduce Ray, uh, known as Sensei Hacker here in the community. And I've known Ray through Dallas Hackers Association. Uh, we've had a lot of good conversations about uh, different roles we've had in the industry and talking about how he's become a sensei and mentor to a lot of folks in the community. And I think that he has a really good perspective from that uh, experience and have seen a lot of things. So, Ray? Well, yeah, I've been in the security part of hacking for about 25 years now. Um, built a couple of businesses that I sold before I went all corporate and, you know, working for other people. Uh, and I guess hacking hardware and things as long as I can remember. I guess I was six years old. I was taking electronics apart and trying to solder them with the big plumbing, you know, solder gun. And that didn't work very well on electronics, but hey. Um, I don't know, I'm interested in just just about everything in hacking, but what has been really cool, um, we mentioned uh, GHA, it wasn't until kind of recently, that's like three years, that I kind of discovered the hacking community locally, rather than just online, you know, BBSs or whatever, back in the modem days, and this has just been awesome, getting to know all the people. Absolutely. So cool. Thank you so much, Ray. And next, I'd like to introduce Frankie. I know Frankie from a previous workplace. Um, we bonded over the fact that I had the same wig as her. <laughs> and this is back when I had a, I was bald. So I was occasionally wearing a wig because I was like, oh, I want long hair today. <laughs> and so we ended up actually talking about that and the proper way to glue down her wig. <laughs> and um, But I've also known Frankie through uh, her work in that company being a very big proponent and leader in the diversity space for huge, large corporation, um, bringing in uh, different monthly events for women, for uh, underserved communities. And uh, she now is a professional, or they are now a professional comedian uh, here in Dallas, hosting House of Blues, uh, Best Persons of Comedy Nights uh, on a very frequent basis. Hilarious show. Go ahead and attend. Um, and it's also fun to uh, be friends with a comedian who knows how to tell a joke and can then apply it in the most nerdy ways. So, Frankie. Thank you, uh, Vic, uh, V. That was awesome. Uh, yeah, that, that's how I met her. Also, uh, she fixed one of my eyelashes one day when it was falling off. And I was like, you're my friend forever because my whole red team just looked at me like crazy all day. Uh, but yeah, I came from a network and web app uh, pen testing background. Uh, then uh, they saw that I like to do extra things like not my job um, and volunteer. <laughs> and they're like, you know what? You're good at being a strategist. So I became a strategist and uh, developed FinTech's first women's cyber rotational development program. And it's thriving. Um, also, uh, women uh, cybersecurity workshop for kids with Victoria, a V. It's fine. <laughs> and also Lindsay over here. Uh, she was also part of the workshops way back when. Um, but yeah, uh, this is why I, what I do now is uh, comedy. I said, fuck it. <laughs> oh, can we curse? I mean, I don't think anyone here is going to be grossly offended. Hopefully not. That's, Sir, that's not. you gave me puffed up Skittles, all right? <laughs> Just keep it If anyone's interested in uh, actually Skittles, uh, we got a business idea that we formed here and made a business at lunch with, uh, at with lunch. Quantum. So, I want 20%. Uh, he's going to be at your local farmer market soon. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about our panelists. And thank you guys so much for being here. I really appreciate it. So what is burnout? Uh, just to kind of level set. Uh, it's a syndrome conceptualized resulting in a chronic workplace stress. doesn't always have to be workplace, just to be very clear, actually. Um, that has not been successfully managed, and it can be in three different dimensions, be it uh, feelings of energy depletion, just sheer exhaustion, fatigue, increased mental uh, distance from your job. So kind of that disassociation and depersonalization. Um, also feelings of negativism, cynicism. Um, and reduce professional uh, efficacy, so how well you feel you're, you're doing or how well you're actually doing, potentially, in your, your role. Um, 
Imposter syndrome can be uh, defined as a collection of feelings and, uh, of inadequacy, so uh, despite uh, evident success. So it's kind of like, you know, you're having a really good quarter. Uh, your boss is like, oh, you're doing amazing. Uh, you get, you know, above meets uh, expectations. And you're just like, oh, I thought you were going to fire me. I thought I was doing so bad that, uh, and that happened to me this summer. I genuinely went into my uh, mid-year review. I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to be put on a PIP. <laughs> what is it? Process improvement plan or something? Personal improvement plan. <laughs> Hopefully. Um, but yeah, so it's not always a good thing if you're in like corporate to be put on that. You know, it, it is like the next step to eventually being potentially laid off, essentially, or what have you. And so I'm, th I'm thinking, I'm like, I'm doing terrible. I messed this up. I messed this process up. And then I go into the meeting and she's like, you're doing uh, above and beyond and we're looking at potentially uh, giving you a raise like next year. I'm like, are we looking at the same stuff? <laughs> so you know, perception plays a lot into imposter syndrome. Uh, it's not necessarily someone who feels like they don't belong in the community or the, the role if they're not actually performing, if you're just, you know, not good. It, this is specific to evidence success. Why? Oh, no. Cool. That's not. Thank you, guys. What? No. Oh, my goodness. Where to go? Just read your messages real quick. Uh, nothing interesting, don't worry. Just social scary numbers, you know, I just text them. Um, so that's what burnout and imposter syndrome is. Um, things that cause burnout in particular are a combination of stress versus stressors. Um, this goes into uh, stress causing a fight or flight or freeze reaction in your body um, when the stressor, uh, stress and stressor, uh, are working against you. Um, they can be work stressors, financial stressors, emotional stressors, so like in your relationships or dealing with bosses, dealing with coworkers, um, not getting paid enough uh, or feeling like you're overpaid uh, sometimes for your role. That That is a challenge for some people. Um, then that's kind of uh, what then leads to burnout, the constant building of these stress and stressors and un not managing them. There's actually 12 stages. Um, you know, typically it actually starts really good. You just have excess drive and ambition. You're really, you know, go-getter and you want to sign up for everything at your job. You want to say yes to everything. Um, you get signed up for things, voluntold, uh, and you want to prove above and beyond. But then push yourself harder to work, neglecting your own needs. Maybe you're staying up later. Maybe you're not eating as well. You know, we've all had those days probably you're, you're working and you just don't have time to even go to the restroom because you have back-to-back -back meetings. Um, then you go to like blaming uh, others for uh, the stress you're under all the way down through feeling detached, inner uh, emptiness or anxiety, losing meaning, that depersonalization, feeling like you've lost yourself and your passion to depression and mental and or physical collapse, uh, which can actually lead to serious heart issues uh, long term. So how we see it in cybersecurity or how I've seen it in cybersecurity is multitude of ways, which is why I wanted to bring a panel and talk about the different experiences they've had with these uh, challenges in their careers and what they've seen. Um, personally, I've felt imposter syndrome in the sense that I've never felt technical enough. So kind of like, hey, I'm presenting at a hacking convention or conference and I'm just like, I don't know what some of these panelists are even talking about when they're going into all these containers and I'm just like I'm just like I don't do I don't do coding, I'm not technical. And uh, my friend who couldn't be here today, Chuck, he uh, actually kind of uh, leaned into like, no, you are technical. You've talked about these things. Again, that imposter syndrome of not feeling like you're fulfilling what you're expecting to get or holding yourself to a higher standard. Um, so yeah, we're going to go ahead and just jump into the panelists' questions and let them speak to their experiences. Um, and the first question, we'll start off with Frankie. Have you ever experienced uh, burnout or imposter syndrome in your career? And how does that uh, per affect your perception of working in information slash cybersecurity? 
All right, a minute and a half. All right, here Something we go. Something like that. <laughs> uh, it's okay if you go over. Yeah, of course. Uh, no, yes all, to all the things. So uh, I will say this: uh, it got to a point where uh, I was working on my computer, 6 a.m. to 3 a.m. meetings globally, and I felt the right side of my face slump. Right. And you know what? I still didn't get it checked out at the time. It, it's, it's, it's insane. And what you're doing, you're so hyper-focused, especially if you're neurodivergent like myself. You, you get hyper-focused and you're like, I gotta get the work done. Gotta, especially before uh, the report of your uh, ratings and mm -hmm. reviews. And, um, and quite honestly, I did not know I was pregnant at the time. I lost my baby after a month. So that's when I knew, okay, I am working too hard. Yes, I, I'm achieving and all this and getting all these things, but I did not even realize and get to check in with my own self and my body um, and make that paramount. But I made my employer, the initiatives, the, the, the goals that I had set paramount. And uh, so yeah, short answer is yes. Thank you. Holy shit. <laughs> follow that. I don't know if I can follow that. Uh, oh my God. I'm going to go go to a room and cry. I'll be back a little later. Um, so yeah, I'm going to come at it a little bit different. Um, my experience has been, hey, we need to fix X. Hey, we need to fix Y. Hey, you're going to get hacked. Hey, I did a security review. Hey, why are there why is there nearly $40 million missing from your account? Yeah, that's been my experience. I worked for a company, which I won't say. I did a security review my first week, and about four months later, they were hacked through social engineering. Someone sent a malware, changed the wiring instructions on a loan, and that money went to a Eastern European bank, and nobody noticed. So my experience has been, as in a data professional, say, hey, we need to fix this, and nobody listens. So the way I keep my blood pressure down is I can give you all the information, but I can't lead an ass to water <laughs> and make them drink. Um, and you just got to let it go. That's been my thing. And if it bothers you too much, you change jobs. And you know, as a data professional, I've done that a lot. And it's been very rewarding. And actually, ironically, the job I have now, I, I thought I was applying for Akamai. Yeah, I wasn't. It was a different company. And it's actually a really good company. <laughs> and I love it. Um, but, you know, I mean, you just kind of deal with it. And we've got all kinds of problems. And the big thing is that I deal with is you never let go of a crisis. That's change. That's when you take. You give them the data, you push it, and say, hey, this is the time we need to move. That's been my experience. Never waste a crisis. Because I've always been in the team that says, hey, we need to fix this. We need to do this. We need to do that. We can show you all kinds of security holes. But if no one wants to fix it, it doesn't get fixed until someone wires $20 million to you know, Eastern European countries. And there's nothing you can do about it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah Frankie does win this round. <laughs> 1,000 points. Um, Thank you. But, yeah, I, uh, my, probably my biggest imposter syndrome moment was when I bailed out of a multi-million dollar deal that I had put together. I assembled some of the, the top business leaders back in the, at the time on the internet. This is back in the late 90s when the internet was small. Um, and, you know, I, I put together some, some top leaders and we were all going to get a cut of this. And, and I just kind of bailed out because eventually they're going to figure out that, you know, I'm not a big shot like they are. Ah, oh, that was incredibly, incredibly stupid. Um, and I spent the next 10 years probably, um, you know, feeling that imposter syndrome well, I, you know, I was developing standards, I was doing, you know, doing good work, but just, I guess, there we go, it shouldn't be going to sleep mode, but hey, it wouldn't hurt to uh, touch the touch pad every now and again, just for fun. Um, where the heck were, oh yes. Um, 
was the multi-million I, dollar deal for? Was it for an ISP or something? Or? Um, essentially, it was a... If you did a top eight who's who of the online porn industry, <laughs> I got everybody in the room that did all the different parts of porn, and we basically did a deal where we were going to get like 5 to 10% of everybody else's money and split it. So, yeah. So we basically get like 5 to 10% of all the porn money ever made. But, yeah. Um, we'll go, we go in the morning. Uh, yeah. Anyway. But, yeah, so that potentially was led to the fact, or, you know, that happened partially because you thought, like, well, I'm not a big shot. But, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm like, okay, you guys are the big shots. I, sure, I put the deal together, but you guys are the big shots. I'll just go hide in the corner. Um, and I spent the next 10 years hiding in the corner. It's like when, when I spoke at my third grade daughter's school for, like, career day or whatever, and I'm like, I'm a hacker. And all the kids are like, ooh. And I felt the same way, even though I've been doing it five, ten years. Yeah. It's like... Oh, but real hackers are so cool. Like, that's not me. Uh, until I actually got connected to the local community and got to know some local hackers. And, like, we speak the same language and play with the same toys. And, like, mm -hmm. I am one of you guys. Yeah. Which was so cool. Absolutely. Um, so, like, uh, before uh, the, the imposter syndrome, uh, you know, we talk about imposter syndrome a lot. It's been trending. Um, I, I'd like to look at it differently because it feels like you're speaking negative over your life. Um, it, maybe it's the intellectual elitism that you face in the workplace and there's only one way of, of learning or one way of working with someone that they expect from you. Um, it's not, I, I feel like, one, for example, I wanted to train a different way for cybersecurity education and this particular person, a white man, uh, <laughs> wanted to make sure that the learning track was exactly the way he learned. It was 50, 11 books. I said, sir, not everybody's gonna read this. Why, why don't we add some video games? Why don't we add some tactical learning? Something to be accessible. Um, but I, I got shut down and I thought, damn, I, I, I guess I'm not as smart as him. And um, I, I just took that on and embraced it instead of saying, nah, I could see things with a different perspective than he can. Um, and uh, that's been my whole career. I think uh, uh, Carrie, if he's here in the room, um, he's sat down with me many times to mentor and um, me and, and hacking and everything like that. But I just learned differently. And I, I, I took down three... Uh, database centers all at once through a nice nmap scan that was found out that their servers were whack so but anyways you know it, it anyways that's that's the end of that i, I think yeah. you touched on something critical there that um i want to kind of expand on it and take it in a different direction um that i think is true for me and i know it's true from, for some friends of mine um like we talked you, you talked a minute ago about you know, feeling like you weren't really one of us or whatever because, mm -hmm. you know, you're not down in the code and the tech skills. Right. And, you know, I have felt the same way because people talk about these policies, GIAC or whatever the hell that is, and I have no idea what that is. Yeah. I can write assembly code, right? I can get in, get into the firmware, do whatever the hell you want to do. The stuff she talks about that she works on every day, half of it I don't freaking understand. And I think that's, we could probably come up with a dozen different groups here, if not 50 different groups, that all know different things. That's the thing about security, yeah. is everybody has different skills, different ideas, and I can look at it and go, well, I don't know 90% of it. In security, if you know 10% of the entire security field, give me your resume, actually, in which is what I told her. I'm like, send me your freaking resume, because you know shit I don't. But, you know, we each feel like we're missing something. Well, yeah, because right. nobody knows everything. Right. A huge portion of that is, you know, kind of wanting to, to know it all. Uh, I think I said the other day, the more, you, the more you learn, the more you know you don't know. And that makes you feel, or some people feel, like shortcomings. Like, oh, my God, I don't know anything about this domain, this domain, and everyone else does. And feeling like you have to do more and more and more which sometimes leads to that burnout um, and over overstressing yourself. Um, I wanted to shift a little to see if uh, y'all 
have ever had any experience of like social media burnout or experiences with imposter syndrome on say social media uh, because it's a huge area uh, of the cybersecurity community is online. It's Twitter, it's Discord, um, LinkedIn to a certain point as well. And seeing sometimes everything people are posting and what they're doing and that highlight reel, it's an overexposure specific to cybersecurity um, because so much of the, the community is online. So have you all experienced anything relating to that with your social media? Personally, I don't really, I mean, so uh, from a social perspective, yes, because mm -hmm. from a trans person, imposter syndrome kind of seeds inside of you every day, but as a mm -hmm. techie, I just go, oh, me, how the mm -hmm. hell did they do that? Fuck, I need to learn that. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I want to dig, and I want to learn, and I want to do that. So not so much really social media. Social media kind of gives me things that I want to focus on. Okay. More than like Alyssa Knight, who's a trans gal, mm -hmm. she does some cool shit with cars. Like she's at a level that I really wish I was at. And like that would be like if I was paid to hack into cars by the federal government, hey, I would be that would be like the dream job for me. So yeah, it, at one level I feel kind of like, wow, why am I not as smart as her? But at the same level I'm like, well, I went a totally different path. I've got a degree in sociology and philosophy. Um, I know gangsters in Boston. I've had a completely different life than she's had. I mean, you know, while while Loft Heavy Industries was doing their thing in downtown Boston, I was hanging in the North End drinking with, you know, the Ferula Syndicate. I mean, it it, it, it was just a different. My life was in a different place back then. Yeah. Um, so, but so yeah, I mean, sometimes I do kind of, when I compare myself to other trans girls who are in tech, like Alyssa and some others, I think, damn, I'm a moron. But then I like, well, you know, cut yourself some slack, look and see you went a different area, you went a different path and fuck it. It's okay. Who cares? Thank you. Um, that's badass. Uh, I didn't know I was sitting next to somebody that's associated with gang-related activities. Oh, no, my next-door neighbor literally got raided by the state police. I'm walking up the stairs. They're like, what are you doing here? Oh, uh, I, 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 I live here. Go in your apartment. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, I, I live next to some really sketchy friggin' people. <laughs> Same. Uh, <laughs> uh, social media. I'll say LinkedIn. God dang it. Fucking LinkedIn. So, uh, you know... Clearly, you know, I get all the accolades. I'm in cybersecurity. I'm a growing leader. I'm an industry leader. Cool. I jump ship. I decide to choose me. I want to save myself and redeem myself. I uh, got a ton of messages. What are you doing? Why are you leaving cyber? What? <laughs> I could get you a job here. You, you don't understand. You were leading like the whole generation, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, I need to save myself. Do you not understand that? And then when I decided to jump ship, which was comedy, no one was like, uh, are you okay? Uh, is everything all right? Uh, and I'm like, yeah, no, I'm serious. I'm going to do this. I took my first comedy class last year. Now, I wrote comedy for 10 years, but I, oh, I did it in tech conferences. Mm -hmm. I did it at my public speaking at work. But no one fucking knew. Uh, so I was like, nah, I'm going to really do this shit. And I'm now contracted by Live Nation. I have three shows monthly at House of Blues, Dallas, and Houston. I took my skills that I learned in corporate America and transferred it over to something that I wanted to do. So currently, everybody's now realizing this, all my coworkers and my co old companies, and they're looking on LinkedIn like, <laughs> what's going on? You know, I got a job for you. It's okay, you don't have to do this. It doesn't make a lot of money. I know you're good, you know. And I have to face that and I have to challenge myself like, no, this is what I want. I know it's not cyber, but I will always be a cybersecurity evangelist, always, um, because it, it granted me economic mobility out of a economically deprived background. I grew up in New York in the hood. This is, this and, and who's to say you, don't ha you can't go back to it? I mean, it's not like, oh no, you're gone. You can never go back. Right. I mean, shit, I'm here. I was like, you want me to speak? Sure. 
Um, but the thing is, I can't discount the last 10, 13 years in IT and eight years in cybersecurity. That, that knowledge will always stay with me. Yes, I'm not hacking every day. No, I'm not practicing. I'm not hands on the keyboards anymore. However, I can still find gaps. I can still find vulnerabilities, even in people's conversations. I socially engineered my way to get to the thing that I wanted today. Don't tell them that. Uh, <laughs> but there, there you go. Thank you. Well, let's check out your social media, Twitter or whatever. It's probably freaking hilarious. <laughs> You're making fun of some dumbass security shit. Um, Always. Yeah, I, I just stayed away from social media until recently. Um, I can't, I don't know how you can be on social media every day and not just get burned out by the bullshit. Yeah. Um, Especially right now. I, I, I just got on Twitter, what, two or three months ago? Mm -hmm. Because that's where the InfoSec people are, like it or not, that's where, that's where it is. Um, for me, I mean, I'm burned out on the friggin' politics and the other crap, because I love cybersecurity, I love hacking. Give me all of that. Mm -hmm. And, fuck it, you know, Give me it in comedy form, so just some XKCD shit, whatever. Like, give me the hardware, the software, whatever. Um, the the Twitter infosec community tends to have a lot of people with strong political ideas. Some of which class. Some people know some things, and some people know some things that are wrong. And I, yeah, that's what burns me. I, I want to read. I don't know. No, I get it. I just but love calling out Ted Cruz and, you know, yeah. Abbott, you know. Like, I mean, that's, I really get off of that stuff. It's like, dude, you are whack-a-mole fucking crazy. <laughs> I mean, like, have, have you ever read the Texas Republican, like, um, platform? I mean, it is whack-a-doodle. Like, there's literally I I items in there about seceding from the fucking union. Like, I can't make this shit up. <laughs> So yeah, I kind of get off, but I'm also kind of like, so one of my side gigs is I'm a chaos coordinator for a book that I'm writing. Um, so yeah, I, I, I tend to stir shit and laugh, but not in a mean way, but in a very, yeah. But you know what I just discovered? And everybody here probably knows this except for me. So you guys can just laugh at me. But I just recently discovered that on Twitter you can have like the muted words where if it mentions like... Elon Musk, you don't yes. even see the tweet? Yeah. Oh my God, I'm going to put Ted Cruz, Republican, Democrat, Trump, all that shit, and I'm not going to see any of their posts unless they're about security. Right. And I'll be happy. Right. I think, <laughs> I think the overexposure of social media, and that's my personal opinion, can definitely burn people out, whether it's their intended subject of what they're looking for, be it information security, and they're just getting all this noise versus just the overwhelm of the speed of the cybersecurity and hacking industry because there's always something. There's always something you got to keep up with. The next hack, you know, that's why we have the news at DC 214. We have the Patch Tuesday. Like, what all is going on? And there's so much to keep up with. And sometimes I think some people get overwhelmed by that and just completely shut it out. See, that's why I like databases. Because it's the same stupid shit again and again and again. Like, yeah. Oh my God, like it's the same exploits that I see. I'm like, no, you don't want to do this. No, this is a bad choice. Right. So yeah, that's, that's one of the reasons why I do like databases because you do see the same bad security practices and you right. get to have the same conversations with the same or different people. But yeah. Gotcha. Well, hopefully not the same people every time. No, no, not the same people. Sometimes people. it feels like it is. Um, my next question was, have you ever uh, been rejected in your career that made you feel as if you didn't belong, and how did you react to that? I'm going to start with Ray this time. Uh, actually, the first, like, two years, I was trying to get into kind of corporate, get hired as cybersecurity, coming out of having my own companies and whatever. Yeah, like, first two years, I could not freaking get a job anywhere. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I already felt like I was kind of like the fake internet security guy, like not a real security guy, just an internet security guy. Uh, and oh my gosh, yeah. Um, and you know, I probably would have given up, except I was hungry. You probably thought I was going to say I was hungry for something. I was hungry. I needed a job to get a paycheck, so I had to just keep applying. Uh, mm -hmm. Fortunately, a friend of mine like told her boss. 
hey, this Ray guy's friggin' genius, awesome, whatever. And I, he was stoned when he said that, but you know. And, and got, got me a little job at a little government agency, so yeah. Awesome. So I want to tell a story about Satan's barometer. So I worked for a help desk. So who here has heard of EDS, Electronic Data Systems? The worst soul-crushing company you could ever work for. I worked for, a comp I worked for EDS in Boston in Natick um, for uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield. And I worked for this woman by the name of Ann Barr. I'll use her real name. We called her Satan's Barometer. And the reason was is there were some things that even Satan couldn't do. And so Satan would use her as a barometer. That job, I was so beaten down. Like that was probably my experience that I just realized. I nearly left, I, I applied to SMU for, I came this close to getting my MBA and just leaving tech forever. Like yeah. I was gonna move back to Texas, get my MBA, forget about tech. And then I got my first tech gig, real tech gig, um, at a company in um, Wakefield, Mass. And I stayed. But I didn't think I could do it. I was literally out there giving coffee every day so that the other um, tech people wouldn't think I was an imposter. And I was like, hey, you want coffee? You want coffee? You want coffee? I'll make a coffee run. I'll be right back. Like, that's how desperate and scared I was. And I just studied my ass off and just beat, you know, just learned as much as I could, as fast as I could. And, um, Am I yeah. even answering the question? <laughs> That's why I'm, I'm kind of rambling. No, it was about rejection in your career. And so, yeah, that was the first mm -hmm. time I felt really, 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 really beaten down. I think after Ann Barr, I built a shell that couldn't be pierced. <laughs> after that, I was just like, there were some jobs that I applied for that I had no business applying for. Sure, I, I kind of knew it, and I would get on interviews, and... I could tell on interviews, like, yeah, this guy's a severe asshole. I do not want to work for this person. One asshole was literally on his phone during the interview, and I was like, I think I'm going to get up and leave here. But, um, but yeah, yeah. But. Um, I, uh, so I will say this. I transitioned from the technology space to operations space. In the tech space, I was the only... Uh, black person most of the time, let alone only woman in my team, um, but I never felt rejected by them. I don't care how different our opinions were, um, even when we did talk about Trump, it, I, there was always something to laugh about. There was always something to talk about. I, I'm grateful for my upbringing because we could talk about wrestling <laughs> in the workplace. We could fucking, I could, Rey Mysterio your ass. like. I, we would talk about cars, we would talk about all the things, video games, I, I, I never felt rejected, and I, I thank my brothers, uh, actually, for, you know, even getting to be a part of his upbringing, um, because it allowed me to be accepted by the guys, um, and I knew that was my angle. In order for me to be accepted, I have to play this game, and it was code switching for me. But it was natural to me. So um, I could joke about, you know, strategy and uh, <laughs> Will Ferrell joke. Okay, you guys didn't get it. Is this also where we time. had the Nerf gun wars? It, right. Yeah. yeah. And so, but when I went to operations, uh, I couldn't bring that same humor over. <laughs> and I quickly realized, oh, I am alone. <laughs> and um, I, I, I was definitely, uh, there was this one comment. It wasn't said to me. It was my teammate that said to our supervisor, and she stated she communicates differently. Oh, come on. So I can't work with her. So she allowed her to refuse our weekly one-on-one -on -one meetings. My entire position while being there. I, I, I never felt so rejected, only because she didn't like the way I communicated. And um, one time, uh, my supervisor, while we were talking, she was like, are you being facetious? I'm like, of course, this is a terrible job. Why not? <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm miserable. You yell at me every week. <laughs> like, so um, I, I just, I loved working with the guys in the tech room. And then when I saw other women like V, Lindsay showed up, I was like, oh, there's hope. I'm not the only one. And more black people, hey! What's going on? Um, I was so excited. So 
like in the last 10 years, I saw me being alone to now more people that look like me were in the room. And I was, and so I was grateful for that. But yeah, when it got to the more pin buttoned up type, it, 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 it's different, but it can work. So I learned how to speak their language, social engineer them. And then I rose through the ranks because I mimicked them. Yeah. Code switch. But uh, other than that, yeah. Yep, that's my experience. So I think what we were just talking about ties into this. And I think having that connection you had with your brothers to be able to make with those guys, having your connection with your friends on the internet and the community on the internet, um, that community specifically is what helps get rid of parts of imposter syndrome, parts of your burnout, because you're creating that connection and helping drive your, your purpose. Um, I was going to do this as how has your involvement in the community affected you, but I just saw the five minute warning. And so I wanted to make sure we have at least a few uh, questions. Um, I saw a hand in the back first. How much do the absurd uh, job postings play into imposter syndrome? Um, probably a lot. And I will say from a woman's perspective, we are less likely to uh, apply for a job than a guy if we don't meet every single line on these job postings. And that number is 60%. Men apply for jobs if they meet 60% of the qualifications on a job app. Yep. Women wait till 100%. Y'all need to get it together. And that job list, my, my job listing has been there six months. I'm still waiting for you guys to apply. Ladies, if you meet 60, 70 percent, send me your resume, please. It's a wish list, not a friggin' right. requirement. Next question. So, um, D, you might have experienced this from a, a GRC side, but um, I like that security becoming more mainstream now and people are starting to realize, oh crap, this is something we actually have to care about. Yeah. Um, but I feel like a lot of the focus is on the technical side and not the non-technical side. Mm -hmm. When um, a lot of other presentations I hear about, a lot of things that I see in the industry are the root problem is not a technical problem, right? Like you talked about a lot of the, the database issues being the same. Well, a lot of it's because laws haven't changed or yeah. other stuff, right? Like, we talk about why am I still using Windows 7? Why am I still using Windows XP? Well, because the aircraft that I got certified with the FAA requires that it stay that way. Yep. I literally can't change it, right? So have you seen any kind of bias or imposter syndrome from that perspective of I'm not technical, but I don't want to be? And how have you kind of approached that? I'm going to say for at least myself, yes and yes. <laughs> and I don't think we have a ton of time, but I'd love to talk more on that. But that's partly why I wanted to have this discussion with the panelists today is because I've been always telling myself I'm not technical, I'm not a hacker. And you know, I may not be explicitly a hacker, but I am technical, even though my specialty is governance, risk, and compliance. A real life, if you can track down a cheating boyfriend on social media, you are a social engineer. Period. That's your baseline. And work off of that. Anybody can be a technologist. It, it, come on. You had a question? I was just going to say, um, I think um, gatekeeping, which you experienced with the training, the guy wanted you to train only the way that, you, that he wanted you to do it. Gatekeeping online and on social media. Also, people coming in with women and mansplaining things that maybe the woman even wrote the book on, mm -hmm. those those things contribute a lot to imposter syndrome. Absolutely. As far as gatekeeping goes, um, HR gatekeeps. Whenever somebody comes up with requirements for a job, what you see on that ad out there is typically 50% bullshit <laughs> on, and another 30% buy-in from managers who you'll never interact with. I've interviewed candidates uh, after HR came up with a list. I've hired folks and then trained them who had, at best, 20% 
of the stuff that was asked for, and that typically was good. HR and upper management expects these folks to hit the ground running, which is completely unrealistic, mm -hmm. because they don't know your corporate culture. They don't know which website to go to to get anything accomplished. The minimum to get a new, and let's face it, in a new job, regardless of your experience. You I, I hate to interrupt you, but our, our time is, is up because we have another speaker coming in. Probably everybody in the audience could do five or ten minutes on this topic. But do we have one more, like, a question yeah, for, for Veer for the panel, an actual question? What's the solution for imposter syndrome? Or, or how do you Ooh, talk your shit. Uh, so uh, one of my main things I wanted to uh, advertise is the hacking community. Again, kind of tying back to this connection with other people uh, and that community uh, involvement really helps you disassuage your imposter syndrome. That just like you said earlier, starting to come to these things over the past few months, few years, has really like, oh, I am one of you guys. I think that really, really helps. And I also just said, see the table outside for all the meetups. Um, that in-person connection is really valuable. I think um, also mentoring, mentoring is huge. That's, yep. that's the biggest too. And Conferences and mentoring, I think, are the two biggest yeah. for me personally. Yeah. For me, I can come in, I hear all these speakers, and I don't know half the shit. But for me to get up, like at DHA, for 15 minutes and do a talk on the shit I know, that little thing I know, and then have three or four or five people come up to me afterwards, and they want to know more. Yeah. That, that is key to me, because I realize, wow, like these real hackers, they're coming to me with questions about the thing I know, and I come to them with questions about what they know. Yep, absolutely. And, you know, trying to be candid with yourself and acknowledge your actual strengths. Um, if anyone would like to talk even more after this, I did uh, have even uh, for burnout uh, something about Ikigai and helping find your purpose and reason. Um, I'll distribute this on Twitter. Um, and yeah, at Vanity Devil. These are the Instagram and Twitters for uh, the folks, uh, the panelists. Thank you guys so much for uh, being here today. And thank you, everyone, for being here for your questions and comments. I really appreciate it. Thank you, V. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go get a cannoli over here.